So teaching translation technologies fits into our subject, just like the, uh, the one we had on ethics last week. That is, we've been through all these things to set up the framework for what we're going to do. And now we're looking at how individual contents modify all that and actually change the best made plans of mice and men. Uh, ethics did that. Technology is another one that uh, brings out its own criteria, as we'll see. And the first thing that I have to make known here is that the technology is a mobile object. It's not just one thing. And I just go back to my own personal view, all right? I remember in the year 2000, so a long, long time ago, I set up a postgraduate course in translation technologies. And it was really successful because um, at that time, everybody was talking about translation memory suites, especially Trados, but also others out there in Spain. People talked about deja vu a lot. And a lot of people didn't know about them. And so we got uh, people who had been trained as translators. We got professional translators and we got people who wanted to become translators all coming in and they were really interested in uh, translation memory suites because that was the technology of the day. Uh, they cost some money. And so people were saying, oh, well, I, I've got to know about this before I know which one to purchase or if it's worth purchasing, okay? So we actually uh, set that up. It worked very well. I organized a series of conferences in those years, bringing together people from industry and, and leading academics who had published in the field. Uh, and it was um, interesting and lucrative. Uh, I even in 2000, and let me see, five, I think, we started doing that online. We had an online postgraduate certificate course in translation technologies. Over the years, what's happened there, back then in the 1990s and into 2010, around about, uh, people were interested in translation memory. So that's Trados, uh, Memsource, um, Matecat, Wordfast, all those things, all right? Um, machine translation has been getting better and better. So from 2010, you get statistical machine translation. There used to be something there called a Google Translator Toolkit, which was very useful as well for integrating the two technologies. And we had to pay more and more attention to machine translation, which meant post-editing at that stage and a little bit of pre-editing. I assume that most of you have done something with translation technology. So if I say post-editing and pre-editing and translation memory, you'll know what I mean. If not, we'll have to go back and, and, and do some teaching for you. Uh, raise your hand if you, if you get lost with, with a few of the basic terms. From 2016, we have neural machine translation, which is, uh, has been improving qualitatively. And it's got to the point where uh, it makes little sense to teach a translation memory without a machine translation feed coming in. And that is to distinguish between working with a translation memory and, and post-editing. And, and so uh, what we teach these days is, is translation memory with machine translation, or what's called just enhanced translation or translating with technology, or the traditional term used right from the beginning was CAT tools. I don't like it, but that's what everybody says. So that's what we've been doing. Now, what's weird in my own experience there is that when I came to this wonderful university in Melbourne in 2017, there was no translation technology. And I said, what? You've got a master of translation with no technology. How can that be? And they said, ah, we forgot to put the learning outcome in the handbook. And so we can't teach it because if it's not in the handbook, we can't teach it. Uh, so I just said, well, I don't care. And I taught it anyway, and nobody said anything. Why did I teach it anyway? Because students need to know this, I think. 
Not everybody, though, in Australia and New Zealand does teach it. Uh, we did a survey, we, Yu Hao did a survey in 2020-21, and of the 13 master programs in translation in Australia and New Zealand, 10 included uh, a translation technology explicitly in their list of subjects. And I think only one really doesn't do um, um, translation technology, and that is at the Australian National University, where they have a program that's very strongly focused on literary translation, uh, which sort of makes sense. Okay, they're not training people for professional industry or big industry. They're, they're more interested in literature, and people tend to think that the technology doesn't work with literature. I disagree, but that doesn't matter. There they are. There has been a tendency for the role of translation technology to increase over those years. This is a study by Rothwell and Svoboda comparing uh, a study done for the European Masters of Translation in 2012 and a repeat study in 2017. So over those five years, which covers the period I just talked about, Back then, almost everybody taught it, but not all of them. In 2017, yes, everybody in the EMT, European Masters of Translation, was teaching technology. And what's more important, for uh, just under 50% of them, the time allocated in 2017 was above 25% of the entire uh, course or program. Uh, whereas it was quite low in 2012. So that's interesting that it's become reached all of them, but this is what is the spectacular growth that people are uh, dedic dedicating more time to technology. So it's definitely an area that, uh, that has been grown, growing. The same people doing the same comparison over the same years um, indicate the growth in percentage of, of the compulsory things. So TM is translation memory, uh, terminology based, term basis, terminology, data mining is essential for, for getting information and uh, project management became the quality analysis tools that are in the translation memory suites. And the other things there I won't go into, but you can see a growth uh, right across all those facets of technology. Uh, but the growth is, um, it's not uniform, okay? And there have been some changes uh, here. So uh, post-editing has become a term where it wasn't on the map back in 2012. And cloud-based translation memory suites uh, have come in uh, as a new thing as well. All right. Now, I move on to questions that are of more interest to us. Uh, we've got the technologies. We've got certain indications of a demand, and I'll come to that demand in a minute. How are we going to teach them? And uh, this is something that we use that you help uh, put together in order to do the analysis. You can do all of these things, right? So lecture-based, I can tell you about the technology. You can discover it for yourselves through certain tasks. You can have small group sessions and activity groups like we do in this class. Uh, you can do a practice thing, which is structured with a guide or and or we can organize group projects. So there are these particular methods and that's okay, we've looked at them. Uh, what Yuhao did in her research was get together 11 teachers from the Australia and New Zealand uh, masters of translation that do technology and got them to fill out a questionnaire. And then there was a focus group discussion. Uh, so we've got the, uh, the various things that can be taught in technology, a long list of things there. And this is the important thing. Technology is not one thing, it's all of these and more, which could be added. And then we got the teaching methodologies that you've got there. So we could see very quickly Whoops, that you can't see. I'm supposed to go red. Okay, <laughs> you can see that 
for example, background knowledge is obviously good to be done by lectures. But when you're doing a work with machine translation, pre-editing or post-editing, it's very much over this end of business where students are doing it for themselves. And as you look down, you'll see that most of the weight of the activities falls in this area here, uh, becoming more student-centered as we go along. But there's still quite a lot here that is done through lectures. So the bit on research or discussing professional issues, such as rates of pay and copyright, uh, which are key things as well, and uh, dehumanization or disempowerment of translators, all those things, that's still um, over here on the side of lectures. And you get a good solid lecture on subtitling before you actually go and do it. Okay, so uh, the point to come out of this is that statistically in the analysis, there is a correlation between different contents and different teaching methodologies, a significant correlation. So the methodology you use can't be, oh, it's technology, therefore group work. No, that's not good enough. What kind of technology or what part of it are you dealing with? And that will give you the distribution of the kinds of activities you're going to, you're going to be doing in class. Now, I really think it's important to, to move away from that idea that technology is just one thing and there's only one way of teaching it. What we found in that survey is that people are doing a lot of different things in accordance with the kind of technology they're teaching. Now, what are the real needs for the technology? So this is from Yuhao's research as well. This is now her doctoral thesis, although it was done in 2020. We've got all these things that can be taught, okay? They would be learning outcomes. You could rephrase them all as learning outcomes. And she's color coded them. And she asked the graduates from the master of translation, so 77 of them, which skill or what skill do you wish you had acquired more of for your job, all right? And so we get the breakdown here. And what's interesting is that the ones in pink, which are the technology ones, are not at the top. But I think I've shown you this before. If not, we'll, we'll look at, at it again. For the people who got jobs as translators, it's very pinkish at the top. For the ones who are working with language, not so much. The pink is in the middle, the technology is there. But these soft skills, communication, area knowledge, target skills, critical thinking, project management, decision making, intercultural skills, those are the things at the top. And for the people who are in the other category, are not working so much with language, the technology is right down the bottom. So what this means is that the technology is a real need for people entering the industry, but they may be only a third of the people in front of us. And it would be a mistake just to teach to them and ignore these other areas. It would be a mistake, I suggest, to teach technology as if it were the only game in town. And that's what we've got to get away from. Something similar uh, appears in this survey, which is a very big one, a world survey by Simuti, which is like a club of the most prestigious um, translator and interpreter training institutions around the world. And uh, they asked, uh, what aspects have been of most use for, for jobs? And you can see there that uh, computer and capital training, 37, terminology, 26, project management, we could include here, software like localization, very low. Uh, it's only in the middle. There are these things here which were considered more important. So I want to relativize this idea that technology changes everything definitively for everybody. It's not the case. However, as I said, people going into industry do appreciate it and do need it. One of the reasons you can see here, this is just from a report on the European language industry, which is becoming the domain of very big companies. 
the bigger companies invest far more in machine translation and automation, all right? Machine translation and automated workflow are clear priorities for the larger companies. So this means using machine translation and uh, very complex uh, suites that set up the project management, integrate machine translation feeds and, and uh, translation memory software. Uh, while the smaller segment is still focused on CAT, that is um, the use of the translation memories, the, the technology we've had since the 1990s. Uh, what's also happening here, I, I, I'm not going to go into it at the moment, but in the industry, the big companies are making big profits and the smaller companies are making fewer profits and in some cases uh, making going backwards. That, that the, uh, the structure of the sector is such that the big companies invest in technology and that technology brings them the rewards, the benefits. And if you want to use technology or you want to get a job in that sector, which is the high growth sector, you're going to need the basic uh, technological skills. Now, there are several ways of thinking about the, this and there are good ways and bad ways. When I uh, entered this field in the 1990s, they thought, well, technology is difficult, so we're going to do it at the end of our training program, right? Hmm. And it requires computers, so we had special computer labs built where people would go along and do the class in translation technologies. We didn't have laptops, or not everybody had laptops in those days. Now, that, that thinking has, has disappeared. Now we think everyone needs technology. So it makes more sense to introduce these things, especially the translation memory software and the use of post-editing at the very beginning, uh, because people are using it anyway. They're using machine translation anyway. You might as well have to learn how to do it well. And everybody needs a laptop. So technology is just done in a normal classroom space. Uh, so whereas before it was something done at the end, now it's become part of your basic translation skills. And what we, we've done in Melbourne, and I'll explain this a bit later on as well, is that we give basic technological skills at the beginning. So you, you would do, you do, what do you do? You do make count and word fast, I think, you know, free online machine translation of, um, translation memory with a, an empty feed. And uh, later on, we have a separate subject for the more advanced um, technologies. Okay, so it's separate between basic and, and the end. At the basic level, you show that there's a range of them. You deal with what machine translation is. Uh, you do post-editing and pre-editing, and you do some very basic terminology management. For those you use free online machine uh, things that are easy to learn and you get people to the stage where they can pick up one of these programs and learn to use it by themselves quite fast so we're not teaching these as definitive the technologies for use in the sector we're using them so that people learn how to learn and so the the learning outcome would be that learn to learn <coughs> We also include subtitling just because it's fun to do, okay? At the advanced level though, you get more complex pre-editing and post-editing with the pay license TM suite. So we're using Trados and Memsource at the moment, although I think Trados is going to get the boot and we'll have SmartCat or something like that. Uh, we do project work, more project work, uh, and we do a little bit of website localization and a search engine optimization, which are yeah, how to work with websites and, and, and make sure that they can be found. And we deal with broader issues such as the social impact. So there's some things, basic things down here and other things get, that can be dealt with up there. What are the learning outcomes? Well, for the the subject we have that is called translation technologies, these are the learning outcomes. Understand, or 
I know understand can be interpreted in many ways, but it has understand and use, okay? Or apply, if you like. Translation memory software, post-editing. And this is the most important one. Learn and critically evaluate new technologies. The reason for that is that whatever our students learn in class today will be different from what they're learning and using in work in five years time. That is, this is a field where change is part of the nature of technology. So it's no good that I teach you how to use Trados today if you're using something entirely different in five years time. I have to teach you this to learn and critically evaluate new technologies. Okay, learn to learn. And then very important online teamwork translation projects, which help develop those soft skills, which are still very much in demand. Let me go through quickly some of the resistance. So I'm, I, as you can tell, I'm very much in favor of teaching translation technologies. I like playing with them. I like seeing the field advance, but not everybody uh, shares my enthusiasm. Brian Mossop famously said some years ago, if you can't translate with a pen and paper, then you can't translate. So we, that, what does that say? We have some basic skills we have to train people in, and the rest is just irrelevant. You know, get those basic skills and the rest will follow. My retort would be, if you can't use the technology beyond pen and paper, and pen and paper, that's still technology, uh, you can't get a good job in the current translation industry. So I would sort of agree with him on the one hand, but say we also have to give you these things to ensure employability, even if it's just on the on your con on your CV. You know, it looks good to have Trados or something there. Uh, Chris Durban who um, is um, in the translation industry in Europe is reported to me. I haven't read this directly. It was reported to me in a conference uh, a few months ago. She was saying that if we use machine translation all the time and uh, translation memories, we will forget how to translate with a pen and paper. That is, you're not doing it anymore. You lose the muscle. Uh, like in your body, if, if you're not running, your, your legs become weak, right? If you're not doing a particular activity, you lose the muscle in that area. And so she is, again, focusing on the, the core skills and then seeing technology as an add-on, which is optional. And I agree, but it's just the same way. I used to be able to, to have beautiful copper plate handwriting. I was very proud of my handwriting. I can't do it anymore. The muscle has gone out of my hand, out of my motor skills. But so what? I mean, I get paid for all the work I do with computers. Nobody is going to pay me for my beautiful handwriting, which doesn't exist anymore. And my answer is that some muscle skills have to change over time. Or my other skill is, my other retort is, uh, you can't get paid for, for going around lighting gas lamps in the street in an age when we have electricity, all right? So some particular muscles are going to be lost. This came out uh, this week, actually. There was this uh, uh, newspaper report of uh, a book translated into Turkish. The translator confesses that he doesn't know French. It was going from French into Turkish. Uh, what he did, he put it through Google Translate and then uh, corrected it. He did a post editing in Turkish and he was quite happy with the result and other people revised the check and, and the text and they were quite happy with it. And so there's some discussion about this. Is it still translation? If you can translate from a language you don't know. What's interesting is a number of people who are outraged and say, this is no longer translation when in fact, this has been happening forever in literary translation, uh, people working in pairs, you know, explain that text to me and I'll put it into beautiful French or beautiful English. You know, It happened in the 12th century in Spain, explain this Arabic text to me, 
in some sort of language, and now I will write it down in Latin from what you tell me. Uh, that's been going on forever, so it's not new. What's new is that uh, almost anybody can have, have access uh, to that technology and start to do that kind of work. And I'm not upset by that. The real resistance to technology comes from language learning people who do not like uh, translation technology or even just any translation being used in the additional language classroom uh, because it upsets immersion and restricts fluency. And my answer here is that people above the age of 12, when they're learning a language, when they can write, okay, when you've got writing, uh, they tend to use mental translation anyway. And they, these days, they tend to be using free online machine translation to help them with their homework or secretly under the desk just to follow what's going on in the classroom. So people are using the technology. And my idea is they had better use it well. I mean, it's best to teach them how to use the technology well to learn a language than just let it happen surreptitiously in a secret way uh, where you can't control it or see what's going on. I get the weirdest things said to me by translators now, translators who are professional, have got into the, the top of their profession, in some cases, using old technologies, and they naturally resist new ones. For example, a human can always translate better than a machine. A human with technology can translate better than a human without technology. This is the wrong statement. You do not compare a human and a machine. You compare a human who uses the technology with one who doesn't. And then you can start to talk about the uses of technology. I won't insist, but the machine translation systems are not translating anyway. It's not a machine translating. It's a machine locating previous human translations. All the translations are human at the end. I get people saying, I don't use technology. And then I say, well, how do you write? You know, if you have a pen or paper, that's technology. A computer's a technology. An alphabet is a technology. A clock, electronic communication, we're all using technology. So often the resistance to it is associated with basic ignorance or even hypocrisy. Uh, this is an interesting site for, I, mean, I, I get people to look at at the beginning of the, uh, of, of our subject on translation technologies. It's people giving ideas about little technologies that are useful for them. And, and some of them are just simple things like, you know, keeping track of how long you spend on a translation electronically, so you know how to invoice the translation. Uh, then uh, text to speech tools, lots of people discover that you can get the computer to read your text back to you, your translation. And when you listen to it, you'll notice where all the mistakes are, far more than when you're reading, okay? So there are good little tricks there in the technology, uh, which are all around the big technologies that I've, uh, I've named for you there. The other one is that we could just talk about technology and humans as if they were two opposed fields. No, uh, the younger you are, the more you've grown up with these technologies, the easier you adapt to it. And so often what we've got is resistance coming from one generation speaking against a younger generation and uh, accusing all of their shortcomings on the overindulgence with technology. I, I get this within our own program. Uh, some of my fellow teachers will just say, oh, I looked at the technology, I, I found mistakes in it and I don't need it. All right, fair enough. You can continue with what you're doing, but please let the rest of us experiment with the technology and find out if it really does help us. I think that uh, my recommendations coming out of this would be number one, we have to define the learning outcomes carefully in relation to the different kinds of technology. And number two, I think we have to see machine translation, which is what's really happening in this field 
as a valid learning tool, as just an extended dictionary. Nobody complained about people consulting dictionaries. Why do we complain about them consulting machine translation? And uh, I'll just give you an example of it. We want to get people to interact with computers, not up here where the computer decides everything and we think that whatever comes out of it is good. That's, that's the naive position. That's what we have to move away from. Nor should we be down here where we don't want any assistance that we get from technology because, hey, we're human and we're better. Uh, what we want to do is move away from here, from suggest one alternative to suggesting a few alternatives. Okay, we want to move to four, well, two, three, and four down here, where the computer is used to help us find alternatives. And this is there in a free online machine translation. This is one example I give. Uh, it gives an example, a way to translate that German word, but it gives many other meanings of it and other ways it can be translated. It's a good dictionary and nothing else. In DeepL, I'm translating the same word, the same thing. It gives all these alternatives. It gives uh, information down here, and I select what seems best in that particular context. So I think these are very creative ways of translating uh, with machine translation in this case. Uh, Lingue is an extension of DeepL. You get that information with previous examples, which is the kind of stuff that's in the database of the machine translation. And it's more problematic when you go into, uh, this is Matecat, you're translating the same sentence. And here I've only got one suggestion. Uh, and at the bottom, I've only got one suggestion as well. It's much better to have technologies that can give alternative suggestions and enhance our creativity and potential understanding of the text and adaptation to new readerships rather than just giving one, uh, one rendition there. In summary, I've talked for too long. Technology is not one thing, it's many different things and the training uh, need not be uniform. So different technologies and aspects of technology can be taught at different levels and in different ways. So we had basic and advanced and we had all those different teaching methods that can be used. There is deep resistance to technology and that has to inform a lot of our teaching but I think it may belong to one generation giving away, giving way to another. So it may be a generational phenomenon. It depends on the culture as well. The important point is that if the, we do no training in it, the technologies are going to be used anyway, and they're going to be used badly. And I think that is a, a productive way of focusing this and, and, and looking for the best way to integrate the teaching of technologies is to see them as an extension of what's always been there to help translators, that is dictionaries. These are just very good, very suggestive, uh, high power dictionaries that we can all use. <laughs>